Hi, everybody. Um, I'll, I'll try to keep my voice um, loud and, and projectable so everybody can hear me. Um, I'm going to avoid the, the, the day as I just kind of wander around here. I'm checking my watch. I'm going to uh, try to talk for anywhere from 30 to 40 minutes, and um, we'll have plenty of time for questions and, and comments and, and queries afterwards. And so if there's uh, an issue that you want to raise with me or, or something that you would like me to clarify, then um, I, 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 you'll get the, the, the chance to do that after I, I, I offer some prepared comments. Um, before I begin, let me, um, let me uh, uh, thank a few people. Um, in, in particular, I want to thank the Muslim Student Association. Um, they've, they've done just such a, a terrific job of organizing the event. Um, wonderful hospitality. Um, they've really been fantastic and patient with me as, as I uh, did my normal routine of not answering emails in a timely fashion. Um, so they, they, they've, uh, they, they've really been a, a pleasure to work with and, it, it, I'm, and I'm very proud to be uh, a speaker at, at, at one of their events. Um, and also their, their, uh, their uh, uh, faculty advisor, Nazia Kazi, uh, Professor Kazi, um, gave me a ride from, from Philadelphia. And, and she, she's long been a, a, a friend and ally. And Professor Adam Miyashiro also has uh, long been a friend and an ally. And I very much appreciate their, their, their hospitality. And uh, so thanks for coming and, and spending this afternoon here. What I want to do is focus on two things broadly. And in the amount of time that, that we have, it's, it's, it's a little bit difficult to cover everything that needs covering. So I'm going to try to, to, to sort of sprint through some issues. I want to talk a little bit about um, the, the so-called Israel-Palestine conflict, uh, give you a little bit of background information about it. And that way, we can be on a similar wavelength in terms of talking about our, our Second subject, which is uh, um, Palestine and, and academic freedom. So I'll be talking a little bit about uh, what academic freedom is, how it functions, and why those who are vocal in support of or opposition to certain politics tend not to enjoy the benefits of, of academic freedom. It depends on time and place and tone and language and all kinds of other things. I'll get to it in a moment. And if, we ha if I have enough time, I want to talk a little bit of also about uh, sort of organizing and movement building in, in, in response to the, the current challenges to academic freedom that we see on campus. And I want to point out, just in case I forget later, that the threats to academic freedom that currently exist, they've been in existence for a long time, but they, they seem to exist in a particularly intense mode right now, are also indivisible from the broader threats that we're seeing on campus today uh, from what, what is popularly known as the alt-right. Some people prefer to, to drop the euphemisms and simply say Nazis or neo-Nazis. Um, some people prefer to call them uh, just racists or white supremacists. Whatever, whatever terminology you use, a kind of a right-wing ethno-nationalist movement off and on campus that, that is, is more assertively interjecting itself into things like uh, curriculum, um, into things like uh, uh, what can and cannot be discussed, who does and does not have a voice in these sorts of things. So I'm, I'm going to try to tie all of those things together. So in terms of what I say, I, I say it's the so-called Israel-Palestine conflict because uh, I don't know that conflict is the most accurate term that we can use. A, a conflict kind of bespeaks a struggle of some sort between two roughly equal participants or antagonists. And vis-a-vis -vis Israel and Palestine, that's not the case, nor has that ever been the case. What we have instead is an example of one party holding a vastly superior amount of power, that's the Israelis, vis-a-vis -vis the other party, which would be the Palestinians. Israel emerges out of a movement called Zionism, which took hold in the latter half of the 19th century, really started to gain a foothold really after 1880, 1890. And then by the turn of the century, the beginning of, of the, the, the beginning of the 1900s, 
Zionism began to develop in, in Western and Central Europe as a significant movement, and its intent was to, or one of its intents was to ingather the Jews of the diaspora back into the so-called promised land, Palestine, right? Uh, also alternately known as, as the Holy Land and all kinds of other different names, right? But its historical name is, is, is Palestine. The problem, or one of the problems with Zionism as a movement was the land that Zionist leaders intended to settle was already inhabited. And it was inhabited by an indigenous population of Palestinian Arabs. Those Palestinian Arabs belonged to various faith groups. They were Arabic speaking, majority Muslim, with a significant Christian minority, significant Jewish minority, other minorities, Samaritans, Druze. So um, it, it was a it was a it was a multi faith. And if you ascribe ethnicity to faith, a multi-ethnic community. So it was a national community of Arabic-speaking Arabs, known more specifically as Palestinians, who, for obvious reasons, right, weren't too enamored with the burgeoning Zionist movement. Here, a bit of broader historical information might be useful, or a broader historical point. Um, there has never been any case in world history of a native community willingly accepting the presence of a foreign settler. It's never happened. Foreign settlement is always met with some sort of resistance. Very often that resistance becomes violent, but the resistance is inevitable. Any community, you check the records, who has felt that its very existence as a national group is threatened, has fought back, and has often fought back vigorously. In 1947, the United Nations decided to partition Palestine, that is to slice it in half. There were going to be two states, one uh, majority Jewish, one majority Arab. Mind you, more than 60% of the population of historic Palestine, even at this point, was Palestinian Arab. The Palestinians, along with the other Arab states, rejected the partition plan. Israel, in collusion with some of the Arab elite, some of the Arab leaders, such as the royal family of Jordan, what was then known as Transjordan, ended up at war with various Arab states, ended up transversing the partition lines and created what we know as the first state of Israel or Israel within, or as it's now known within its 1967 borders. The West Bank went under the control of Jordan, the Gaza Strip went under the control of Egypt, and in the period from 1947 to 1949, depending on the estimate, anywhere from 600,000 to 750,000 Palestinian Arabs were expelled from their homes, never again allowed to return. To this day, Palestinians comprise a majority refugee population. They live in squalid refugee camps in Lebanon. They live in refugee camps in Jordan, Syria, and Egypt. There's a significant diasporic Palestinian community in Western Europe and North America now as well. The Gaza Strip, which is geographically twice the size of Washington, D.C., is home to almost two million Palestinians. It is the most crowded place in the world. It suffers a blockade wherein Israel controls what goes in and what goes out. Israeli leaders have talked about making sport of the suffering population of Gaza. They have spoken also of putting Gaza on a diet, meaning that they have an algorithm in which they determine how much food stuff goes into the territory based on the population of the territory and what that population's minimal caloric needs would be. It's a brutal, awful situation. The West Bank now has around three million people, and it exists under military occupation. 
let me step back for a second because I sort of jumped forward in, in talking about uh, the plight or the so-called plight of the Palestinian refugees. Um, those 600 to 750,000 Palestinians who were expelled, were reacting to various phenomena that historians, Israeli, Arab, and otherwise have documented over and over and over again by this point. Israel committed, or the young Israeli state, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Palmach strike force, the, uh, the uh, Lehi strike force, uh, a, a lot of the, the pre-Israel Jewish militias at the time engaged in a series of massacres in the Galilee and elsewhere. And those massacres very often resulted in entire villages, or the, the, the men of entire villages. In some cases, all of the, the, the citizens of entire villages being rounded up and shot, and then their bodies dumped into mass graves. It included a, 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 a campaign of burning a campaign of looting. Again, this is all on the documentary historical record. You can look it up. These are things that, that, that not even so-called pro-Israel historians dispute anymore. It was a campaign of terror that drove people from their homes. It is now very often a campaign of state violence or campaigns, consecutive campaigns of state violence that prevent them from returning to their homes. And returning to their homes has been a dream that Palestinians have never given up. The right of return is a fundamental aspect of Palestinian national identity. And no matter how much the Israeli state and its supporters wish it away, it is not, that desire is not going anywhere. It is one that only goes stronger throughout the generations. All one needs to do is visit a Palestinian refugee camp anywhere and talk to the people and ask them what it is that they want for their present and for their future. And inevitably, the answer will be, we want to return home. That attitude is strong. And it's strong in the diasporic communities as well. In 1967, Israel conquered the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Um, and this is where the, the occupation comes into play, the, the military occupation that you hear people talking about. Shortly after 1967, Israel began a settlement program. In other words, it decided to move uh, Israeli communities into the West Bank, into, uh, into strategic sites, into sites that were considered uh, holy or sacred or important, or, or simply good real estate, whatever the case may be. And it's this settlement program, which has been unabated for, for around 50 years now, right, that lies at the current heart of the so-called conflict. You often hear people make sense of or rationalize uh, Israel-Palestine as a, a intract, untr intractable battle between two different people or ancient rivalries or ancient tribal rivalries or people who've been fighting since biblical times and this and that. Listen, that's all nonsense. Right? It's not only historically inaccurate, all right. But it also draws on what I would argue to be pretty profound elements of anti-Semitism and anti-Arab racism. Right? The idea that that's what these people know how to do is fight. Correspondingly, there is a, a fantasy that what is actually needed is simply more dialogue. That if Palestinians and Israelis just sat down and understood one another better right, and learned to hate one another less, then everything would be fine. Problem solved, everybody can move into the future. Why do those people got to be that way? Right? Why do they have to be so hateful? Why do they have to be so backward? Why do they have to hate each other so much? But if you actually look at, at what's happening in terms of political language that can make sense to people universally, it makes perfect sense. Right? What we have, in fact, is not an intractable dispute between two different peoples, but we have an instance of one group engaging in settler colonization against another group, and that other group responding to settler colonization the way that natives have always responded to settler colonization wherever it has happened. There's nothing exceptional, in other words, about the Israel-Palestine conflict. 
If you look at Algerian experiences of French colonization, or Cameroonian experiences of French colonization, or South African experiences of Dutch and English colonization, if you look at native experiences of US and Canadian colonization, you will find the same patterns at play over and over again. And you'll also find the language of, of reprisals, right? And, and the language of, of native violence and all of these sorts of things. It's fundamental, it's basic stuff, right? Anybody who has a simple understanding of the, the so-called conflict knows that this is what it's about. Now, the settlers, the, the Israeli settlers on the West Bank are subject to a set of privileges right, that are withheld to the native Arab population. There is a system of highways that only Jewish Israelis can use. Right? There is a system of swimming pools and schools, you name it. There's an entire civic society right, that the native population cannot access and cannot use. This is why the situation is often called or described as apartheid and compared to, to the situation of, 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 of South Africa up until 1993, 1994. There are problems with the comparison, but as a general metric, it, it, it sort of works. So this is what is happening in, in Palestine right now. Right? We're not talking about uh, a, a group of human beings <laughs> who have an irrational hatred of Jews right? and who just want to harm them right? because uh, they're barbaric Muslims and that's what barbaric Muslims do. We're talking about people who have legitimate political, economic, social, cultural, historical grievances people who are suffering tremendously, people worthy of our empathy because they are living in their ancestral land as second or even third class citizens. Right? I oppose politically and philosophically Zionism, not just because I'm an Arab and it's in my DNA. Right? That, would be the, uh, that would be the racist explanation for people's politics, right? Um, that you can determine uh, uh, somebody's beliefs based on, on, the, on that person's identity, either as they describe it or as you ascribe it to them. I oppose Zionism because I oppose all forms of ethno-nationalism. I oppose all forms of separation based on race, culture, creed, or religion. I oppose all political and economic <laughs> systems in which people are not treated equally under the law. I oppose any system that grants a special set of rights to one group of people based on how the state chooses to name the identity of its citizens or of its subjects. I would oppose any sort of Palestinian state that comes into existence that carries in its legal system the same features that now exist in the Israeli legal system. In other words, what I believe in, and this is what has often gotten me condemned as anti-Semitic or as barbaric or as cruel or as all kinds of other descriptors that I'm sure some of you all have heard, what I believe in is a system in which everybody should be treated equally and granted the same rights and the same access right? to the civic protections of the state. Arab Jew, they both live, they both share a national identity, they both share a nation, and they share the resources that exist within the nation itself. This is a very basic sort of humanism, but it, it's, it's, a set, it's a set of ethics that sort of underlies I, a, a lot of people's opposition to Zionism, and this is one reason why Zionism is increasingly unpopular. Poll after poll after poll after poll in the United States show that, that fewer and fewer people are identifying strongly with, with Zionism as a political <coughs> movement or as a philosophy or as an ideology. Increasingly, people are beginning to understand that the behavior of the state of Israel does not match right, a set of liberal or progressive ethics 
that they, they want to perform in the world, that the two things just don't work together, that they are fundamentally incompatible. Right, so the, these are, those, that's a very, very broad history of the so-called conflict with a lot of my own editorializing to boot. Um, but I, I want you to know sort of where I'm coming from. I want you to know who you're dealing with and who you're speaking with. And as a way also of saying that, that you're, you're speaking with somebody who's happy to speak back, who has beliefs that I've never hid from and, and who has beliefs that, that I will never, ever, ever code I, in some sort of language that I'm scared to make direct or explicit. In other words, uh, I adhere to a set of politics that I'm happy and proud to own. Now, how could the idea of democracy or equal rights be controversial? Well, if you look throughout history, look at just at US history, what was the basis of the, the civil rights movement? You know, let's say the civil rights movement that we're most aware of in the 1950s and 1960s, the one, uh, uh, the one most frequently associated with Martin Luther King Jr. Right? The civil rights movement was, it was about lots of things. Right? It was about economic justice. It, it had an anti-war component to it. But one of its basic demands was right, equality under the eyes of the law. Right? And that was highly controversial. The idea of social justice being tantamount to equality has always been opposed by demographics in any given society that benefit from the existence of injustice. And injustice cannot be sustained anywhere in the world unless somebody is benefiting from it. The benefits can be economic, Right? They can be social, they can be psychological, right? they can be emotional, but as long as a benefit is there and somebody can access those benefits, right, then you have found the recipe for somebody who is perfectly willing to oppose equality. Because with the arrival of equality comes the loss of a certain sort of privilege. So the circumstances change, and it's usually it's economic circumstances, but it can be lots of things. So that's why, in other words, right, an, an idea that, that the occupation of Palestine ought to end, and that Jews and Arabs ought to live together in a single state and share not only a nation but a national identity can be seen as problematic. It can even be seen as hostile. Right? because the status quo is of Israel and beyond Israel is invested in the current idea of occupation and or apartheid. Right? And there are huge economies right, that, that, that share that investment as well. Anybody who has spent a decent amount of time on a college campus knows that the these issues are controversial, right? That there, there are certain things that, that are sure to, to create controversy. And Israel-Palestine is kind of infamous. It's one of those issues that gets people riled up, and it gets people arguing, and then it gets people sort of at one another. All right, so I know that people have like a really deep emotional investment in the issue, in that geography, in that ideology, right? Uh, uh, it, there's, there, there are lots of reasons right? why. We, we don't even need to get into them. The point is where you have cantankerous argument and where you have controversy, right? you automatically also have a relationship to academic freedom. Right? Because academic freedom is meant not only to protect <coughs> controversial opinions, right? but also to arbitrate controversy. Right? To, to make it possible to happen right, without any of the parties to controversy necessarily being punished. Right? Does that make sense? Uh, and if I'm not making sense, just stop me and tell me. Um, and so I'm giving you a very basic, probably idealized view of academic freedom. But academic freedom is something that applies not only to faculty, right, but also to students, and also to employees of the university. Right? We tend to think of academic freedom as belonging to to tenured or tenure track faculty. And the only reason that, that, or the main reason that we think that is because tenured faculty are the only ones who really have recourse. 
like in in the case of violations of of academic freedom everybody else is 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 in a little bit of trouble but academic freedom basically means that that in a university not only do we have free speech but we have the right to pursue controversial research research that might upset various power structures or various centers of power or that we can have uh, uh, an extracurricular life that is a life beyond the campus. So for me, my, uh, most people uh, who know my extracurricular life are, are familiar with, with, with it on Twitter, right? that I had an extracurricular life on Twitter, that extracurricular life caught people's attention. By the way, I don't think that, that I lost that job at Illinois because of, of Twitter. I think that there are other factors at play, but I'm, I'm going to save that because, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, that, that's a tangent that I never, ain't never coming back from. Okay, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna, to just, just, just throw that out there. But, um, so, you know, uh, you have a, a, I don't want to keep using myself as an example. You have a professor, and your professor comes and teaches class, right? You might like the class, you know, you might have been bored over that 50 minutes, whatever, all right? Then, you know, the professor dismisses class, and what do you all do? You know, if you're a student, hell, if you're a faculty member, hell, if you're a sentient human being, right, you probably bust out your gizmo, I don't even know what they're called, and, and you know, catch up with your texts, call people. Some of you get on Twitter, some of you get on Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, all right? Uh, that's the hippest I've ever sounded. All right, uh, I've only ever used uh, Twitter and, and, and Facebook. I really don't know what I'm talking about beyond those things. That's a, like people think I'm a social media expert because I got in trouble for social media. It's like, that doesn't make you an expert, right? It just, just, just means I know how to tweet like controversial things in 140 characters, right? Uh, my skills sort of stop there. But um, the professor and the student have a right to tweet out an opinion without being punished for it, all right? That, that's academic freedom. All right. Or the professor has the right to pursue research or to discover things in her research that might piss off a powerful political community, that might piss off uh, the arms industry, that might piss off the, uh, the, um, the, 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 the computer industry, that might, that might piss off uh, the chemical industry. Right? In other words, a professor has a right to pursue research that says, wow, smoking cigarettes will certainly lead to health problems, right? There's a direct correlation between smoking cigarettes and lung cancer. Now, we laugh, but you all watched Mad Men. This wasn't always common knowledge. Somebody had to produce the research that showed the linkages between smoking and health problems, and you can bet your ass that there were a lot of vested interests that didn't want that research to come out and that were perfectly happy for the researchers making those links to be punished. In fact, plenty of them were. That's what academic freedom does as well. It allows you to pursue research that might lead to findings that might piss somebody off in a very powerful place, all right? And, and the, the faculty members protect it. Now, that's the idealized version of academic freedom. What we're seeing now is, is, is academic freedom as something of a limited commodity, something that applies to fewer and fewer people. Not only was my academic freedom violated, and this is not an opinion, right? This is a, a, a judgment that, that has been arbitrated by federal courts, that has been arbitrated by professional associations, but lots of people are having their academic freedom violated right now because campuses, as you all know, are in a, a tenuous spot. They're in a tenuous position, right? Uh, a lot of social and political battles are happening on campus. Think of the idea of, of a free speech week at Berkeley where they invite right-wing provocateurs to campus, people protest, and then everybody argues on social media for the next week about what free speech really means and, and whether you should punch a Nazi or not, right? Uh, that, that, that's, that's kind of what's happening, and it's playing out on campuses because it very often plays out on campuses. Campuses are sort of a natural spot for, for, for these things to be arbitrated, but not necessarily to be resolved. Well, we're also seeing, along with challenges to academic freedom, the challenges are working because university administrators more and more are less invested in those protections and more invested in maintaining the image of the university as a brand right? or as a corporate entity of some sort. And this is a serious problem. Campus is less a, a, a space of learning, certainly not a space of objective knowledge. It never was. Right? But it's more and more becoming an institution 
highly concerned with real estate acquisitions, right? that is highly concerned with private donations, that's highly concerned with public image, that's highly concerned with a pool of fungible employees. In other words, untenured employees that it can get rid of either as the budget dictates or, or as their politics demand. All right? And I can address any of this in the Q&A if, if I'm not making any sense or talking about the university in, in kind of a broad way. The Center for Constitutional Rights and a group called Palestine Legal jointly released a report about a year and a half ago that showed that in the space of a year that 300 instances of suppression and or violations of academic freedom had happened on US campuses vis-a-vis -vis people who were considered in some way to be pro-Palestine. Of all the things that can get a person in trouble now, I would argue that speaking in favor of Palestinian equal rights or speaking critically of the behavior of the Israeli government or even more specifically rejecting the ideology of Zionism is the thing most likely, right, or at least highly likely, to result in violations of academic freedom. So one of the arguments that I want to put forward to you all tonight is not that you have to agree with my comments about Palestine, my editorializing about Palestine. You don't have to agree with my commitments to Palestine. Right? You don't have to agree with the history of Palestine that I presented. Although I would argue that it's a very accurate history. Right? And that uh, that's a history that you'll see repeated over and over and over again in decades worth of serious scholarship. You don't have to do any of that. But there is no occasion to punish me for the comments that I've made, or for the comments that I might make on Twitter, or for the comments that I might make on Facebook. Right? That, in fact, the culture and the climate that get created when people are punished for articulating controversial opinions is one that manages to negatively affect the entire campus and everybody involved. If you allow, in other words, one community, one political community, one ethnic community, one cultural or religious community to be suppressed, it's not going to be long right, until the suppression uh, makes its move and starts targeting somebody else. Right? It always works that way. One thing about power is that if it goes unchecked, it spreads. And once it starts spreading, it ain't self-correcting. It's not going to rein itself in. It requires us to rein it in. It requires a concerted effort to stand against it to make sure that our rights as students and our faculty are protected. There's an idea a pervasive idea, and I would argue a false idea, that working on BDS, that's Boycott, Divestment, Sanctions movement, I, I can explain it here in a little bit if, if you like, uh, but that's kind of the, the, the central feature of pro-Palestine organizing on college campuses today. It's, uh, it, it, it's a movement that proposes boycotting Israel economically, boycotting it politically, boycotting it culturally. All right. Um, it's, it's, it's controversial, it's, it's much reviled in pro-Israel communities, and those in pro-Israel communities like to conflate BDS with anti-Semitism. Right? And so I'm going to let this be my, my last bit of editorializing, and then I'll turn it over for questions and comments. Um, the only way that anybody can rightly or, sorry, the only way that anybody can peg BDS to anti-Semitism is through assumption and inference. In other words, I ask people to look at the evidence that actually exists. In other words, there are a bunch of BDS web pages. Right? There's a website for US ACB. That's the, the United States Academic Cultural Boycott of Israel. All right, it's usacb.org. There 
are a bunch of leaders <laughs> within the BDS movement who write a whole lot. There are entire philosophies of BDS that sort of hash out right, what it allows and what it doesn't allow. Look to it all. Nobody, not one single critic of BDS, not one single person who accuses BDS of anti-Semitism has been able to find a statement from any of these quarters right, that's actually anti-Semitic. The argument actually relies on an idea that to fundamentally oppose Israel in such a way, right, or to, to quote unquote single out Israel for, for opprobrium right, is, is, is anti-Semitic by necessity because Israel is a Jewish state. Well, I'd like to argue that attributing any state or outfitting any nation state uh, with the burden of carrying the reputation of an ethnic group on its shoulders is a horrible idea. My dad is Jordanian. Right? I in no way want my Jordanian ethnicity or nationality, whatever you want to call it, of which I'm highly proud, I want it in no way to be reflected by the behavior of the state of Jordan. In fact, I want it to be separated from the behavior of the state of Jordan, just like I want my American nationality to be separated from the behavior of Donald Trump, and the behavior of the American government. I don't want my culture and my ethnicity, my religion, my anything else to be represented in that particular way. That's the first point. The second point is it's simply not true. The idea that, that Israel is a state for all Jews everywhere because there are significant Jewish communities that are involved in BDS right, and that also reject identification with the state of Israel. Some do it for religious reasons. Many, most, do it for political reasons. But anyhow, I want to warn us against the overuse of accusations of anti-Semitism as it pertains to criticism of Israel. First of all, because they're usually disingenuous. They're remarkably harmful politically and personally. And then most of all, because it ends up demeaning right, anti-Semitism as it actually exists in this world and as it actually needs to be opposed in the world as well. And in that, in that, I would say that everybody in this room <coughs> has a shared interest in fighting the forces of neo-Nazism that are gathering strength and gathering steam on and off our campuses. But in order to do that together, we also need to adhere to the same ethic that none of us has a certain set of inborn advantages over the other. In other words, we ought to reject all versions of ethno-nationalism, right? whether they exist in an Israeli setting or a southern US setting or a Canadian setting or anything else.